Good evening and welcome to the Institute for Government. Um, I'd like to warmly welcome everybody who's joining us, both in the room here tonight and those of us who are joining us online. We're here, of course, to hear the annual director's lecture from our director, Bronwyn Maddox. For those of you who, who don't know me, my name is David Liddington. I am one of the trustees of the Institute for Government. Uh, before that, I was myself in government and, and uh, a minister and in the cabinet for a number of years. I'm delighted to say that after the last two years, we are back. We are actually here in the building, a handful of us at least. And what the last two years have taught us is that there is an art to running virtual events. So those of you who are at home or in your offices and joining us online, please feel welcome to ask questions when we get to that stage. You will find uh, that, the, that the Slido platform provides a facility for doing that. And I would encourage everybody to think through what questions you'd like to ask, to pose your questions, your challenges, um, and I will call as many as possible of people who are online as well as those who are in the room when we get to questions. The subject Bronwyn has chosen to speak on is what's wrong with Britain's government? <laughs> now, some of you may say that this will take a little longer than the next hour and a half to examine in detail, but I'm sure Bronwyn will take us pithily straight to the point and get us all thinking about what the problems are and just as important what the solutions would be. And I'm also delighted that we're joined on the stage this evening by Stephen Bush. Uh, Stephen is for at least a few more days the political editor of the New Statesman and then he heads off to join the Financial Times where he will be writing a, a weekly column and a daily newsletter there. Now, the, the format is going to be that I will invite Bronwyn to speak to us. After that, I'll ask Stephen to give us his thoughts and then open uh, the, the meeting up to general questions. And I would say, please post your questions using the Q&A function on Slido. And you don't have to wait for Bronwyn to finish. You're welcome to post your questions as soon as you would like to do so. The event is going to be live tweeted from at IFG events using the hashtag um, IFG director. So please follow and tweet along. And there'll also be a video and sound recording of the event on the IFG website within the next 24 hours. So without further ado, over to you, Bronwyn. David, thank you very much indeed. A very warm welcome to everyone. And thank you for handling our hybrid instructions for how to have a, um, an event that um, much nicer than last year is not just online, but includes everyone in line, online as well. A very warm welcome. Well, I have chosen, as David said, this question of what's wrong with Britain's government uh, as the subject of tonight's talk. It's a question you hear a lot at the moment in Britain and beyond. And right at the moment, it risks getting a very blunt answer. The pollsters tell us that two thirds of Brits think the answer is that Boris Johnson is the problem and he should go. I'm going to come back to that question of the Prime Minister and standards in public life right at the end. Let me just say a few things first. The IFG has done a lot on this recently. We've been asked to on many sides. And if a government doesn't observe those standards of public life, people don't trust it. Its ability to ask them to do diff difficult things, such as isolate themselves or pay more tax, is really badly undermined. And a prime minister who doesn't seem to observe the law compromises Britain's ability to defend the rule of law around the world, for example, to assert the value of the UK's democracy in the face of President Putin's threats to Ukraine. Yet while no set of rules will curb someone who wants to break them, our democracy does have ways then to get rid of that person. It's up to the Metropolitan Police and Conservative MPs to decide the Prime Minister's immediate future and voters at the next general election. So we'll see. While that's the consuming drama of Westminster at the moment, 
I want to turn to what is as important for public confidence, and that's the basic competence of government and its ability to devise solutions to the country's big problems. By government, I mean both the elected one of the day and its chosen ministers, who keep changing, and the ranks of civil servants, agencies, and institutions who support them, the big mass of bureaucracy of the modern state. Tony Blair said recently that British government was losing the capacity to identify and solve the country's big problems. And I must say, I think he is right. Many people in Britain, perhaps most, would still sign up to the view that this is basically not a corrupt country. Many things do work well. And we saw that during the past two extraordinary years. There were things like the vaccine rollout. But the examples of the opposite are much too frequent for comfort. And the pandemic exposed those too. Britain has had one of the highest death rates during the pandemic among richer countries and suffered one of the biggest economic hits. Britain accepts compliments for good government when it shouldn't. I saw this years ago in Iraq, where UK politicians and military took credit for the supposedly solved tensions in Northern Ireland and Britain's expertise at brokering that kind of peace. You can see it in the refusal to criticize the National Health Service, which has done many remarkable things and is nationally adored, but it still falls quite a way short of the world's best healthcare. The recent revelations about the Metropolitan Police, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the boasting about domestic violence, they've given everyone a reason to be appalled. And within government, there is a state of complacency about these failings that undermines the way the country works and is deeply corrosive of public trust. Current targets of people's fury, well, there are lots of them, but they include the energy regulator licensing so many energy companies, many now going bust, the rollout of smart motorways without full consideration of evidence about whether they work, the Afghan exit and evacuation, the flailing attempts to curb migration. And high on the list of recent horrors is the wrongful prosecution of more than 700 sub-postmasters because the computer system designed by Fujitsu wrongly decreed that they had taken money from the till. At least one of those wrongly accused took his own life. Others are still struggling to clear their names or reclaim money that they were forced to pay. And last month, Lord Agnew, Treasury Minister, resigned with an attack from the, uh, uh, speaking in the Lords on the government's lamentable record on rampant fraud in government, particularly when offering loans to businesses during the pandemic. So in talking about what's wrong with Britain's government, I'm going to focus on three problems. There are, I could indeed spend much more time, but I'm, I'm going to focus on three core ones that we're spending a lot of time here at the Institute in tackling. The first is the pervasive failings in basic competence and expertise of the civil service and ministers, which means that they propose unworkable policies or they fail to deliver even the good ones. The civil service has got lots of dedicated people there, but it does also struggle to get the people at once and then to give them the skills and knowledge that they need. Ministers are often appointed for loyalty, not expertise, and pour out initiatives that are not going to produce the results that they want. The second point I'm going to make is about the lack of clear responsibility and accountability for performance, both for ministers and civil servants. Where the civil service's responsibility is clear, it can lead to back covering and excessive caution. Where it isn't, it can lead to evasion. And that can create a culture of complacency where the, the consequences of poor judgments don't feel real to those making them. Ministers sometimes take the blame when they needn't, but avoid it when they should. I'd extend this problem to parts of the huge web of agencies and public services, which is so much part of modern government. And that point brings me to my final and third one, the shortcomings of an old constitution straining to support a 21st century government with all its scale and complexity. Parliament lacks power to hold government properly to account. Devolution is really desirable in a big, complex country, but in the UK, it's still patchy. It's anyway no panacea. It needs its own checks and balances and an awful lot of scrutiny if it's going to work well. And the result of these failings is that governments, one after the other, fail to provide answers 
to the country's obvious problems. They ignore the work of the past, they snatch at improvised solutions, they make lofty pronouncements, and then they try to bring those to life in a year or two. The public cynicism grows, confidence about the country's future falls. Boris Johnson led his party to an 80-seat majority because for many voters, he dispelled those worries by sheer force of personality. His government has, indeed, made unusual and laudable efforts to reform the sheer machinery of getting things done, but it's now in danger of failing to achieve that reform as well as its big project of levelling up. And it also risks an entirely unnecessary assault on public trust by seeming to ignore the principles of standards in public life as well as the rules it set for the nation over coronavirus. So let me start in more detail with that first point about complacency and lack of competence in basic government, civil service and ministers. Let's start indeed with Lord Agnew's resignation on January 24th. He'd served as Treasury and Cabinet Office Minister since February 2020, just before the start of the pandemic, and he had special responsibility for countering fraud. He accused the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy of a lamentable oversight of coronavirus loan schemes, which had led to widespread fraud. He added that the Treasury appears to have no knowledge or little interest in the consequences of fraud to our economy or our society, and that a mixture of arrogance, indolence, and ignorance freezes the government machine. Some of his accusation should be directed at his own government, not the civil service. It, his own government decided that vast sums should be dispersed very quickly and ordered banks to suspend normal checks. For example, that a, current, a company was currently trading, that they could establish the identity of its directors. But he's right about the widespread lack of knowledge and care among both civil servants as well, uh, and ministers, and how pervasive this is. There are zones of government where ministers and their civil servants have little deep knowledge of their subjects. They may have little understanding of the implications of making a bad decision, and may not have immersed themselves in the experiences of people on the receiving end to know what that really means. And a big part of that is because they change jobs too often. Ministers have got little control over how long they're in a post, although it's a crucial point that the Prime Minister does. For the civil service turnover of staff, not just between departments, but within departments, is pernicious. It's something the IFG has often criticised. The motives of generally pay and promotion, wanting to get on. The civil service is really blessed with many dedicated, ambitious people who want to do just that. But the result is that they may stay only a year or two in post, and so know comparatively little about their subject, and they may suddenly be dealing with whole new aspects of it. It was evident in the Afghan ex exit last summer where quite a few of those dealing with the petitions for help in evacu evacuation were said to know little about the country. The big block of people who did had long before moved on. And that exacerbates the temptation for politicians to keep announcing new initiatives. We've at the IFG remarked on how common this is, particularly with regional and industrial policy and further education. These problems are not new, they are enduring. Every government, pretty well, has a go at them in some form. This government's effort is captured in its promise of levelling up, potentially a hugely important endeavour. But to achieve anything, this government will have to recognise why so many similar efforts have failed and draw on the ones that have succeeded. The risk is that solutions get reinvented again and again, and failure to learn lessons about what has not worked wastes huge amounts of time. The problems facing the UK are not obscure. They're obvious. They endure far longer than any one government. How much health care people want, how much they're prepared to pay for it. The national debt, low wages, poor productivity, an aging population, social mobility and cohesion, net zero. The failure to build on what has come before means that these initiatives blow away as ministers and civil servants shift job. That's why at the IFG, we have spent a lot of time urging the civil service to curb staff turnover, encourage specialism, use evidence 
systematically, including from other countries, devise ways to retain knowledge in departments. We discourage prime ministers from reshuffles, though we also urge them to move on ministers who are doing badly. Sometimes that does not happen quickly either. There's been a lot of progress in the past 10 years in the civil service with the development of the professions. Those are things like finance, human resources, digital government, people who are really expert in those. There is, though, room for a lot more. And today's reshuffle looks rather more like party management than running the state. Chris Eden Harris is, um, was, was a Europe in his Europe post in the Foreign Office for just six weeks before now becoming Chief Whip. And we have the 11th Housing Minister in 10 years as a result of this afternoon's work. We're later this month producing a key paper urging the government to establish a new statutory role for the civil service to give it the responsibility for maintaining its own skills, its own knowledge, its international comparisons and experience whether you know, about transport or energy or health, all those subjects, complex subjects at the heart of modern government. And we really urge the same on ministers. The IFG offers them bespoke private advice on how to get the best out of their departments and themselves. But all that doesn't answer Lord Agnew's second main point, a culture of indifference or ignorance as to the effect of bad decisions. It's hard to put your finger on it, but you know it when you see it. You might think of the contracting out of probation, not acknowledging that the quality of the service of dealing with troubled families and people could not be easily codified in a contract. Or the failure to ensure that judges have got the right technology leading to delays in court hearings. Or the way the Department for Education last year persisted with its algorithm for awarding grades despite warnings of unfairness to individual students and the chaos in university applications that followed as people had warned. The sting in Lord Agnew's accusations is that if the Treasury doesn't seem to care about losing billions of pounds, it creates the perception that the government will tolerate fraud, it loses its authority with Whitehall departments, and it offends the millions of people who are going to find the coming years financially very tough. There isn't a single answer to this. It's a cultural question. I should say, again, that the core culture of the civil service is one of public service, and many dedicated people give their professional lives to that. But you also find an evasion of responsibility and an obsession with promotion that's less attractive, a disdain for politics, a lack of understanding of the pressures on politicians, and sometimes a shortage of people who can find practical answers to the problems that ministers identify. There is change underway. The civil service leaders, particularly in the past 10 years, have made some important changes. Reform used to be a really niche conversation, a final job for ministers squeezed out of all the others. It's central now, as Michael Gove showed when he was Dutch, uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and as we hope that Steve Barclay will too, although this may be a fragile hope given his new many responsibilities, including Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister. But one of our successes in the past 12 years has been to make this conversation about reform inescapable, although you'll gather from what I've said that I don't regard it as finished. This government's desire to relocate civil service jobs around the country may be a useful antidote to some of these problems I've been describing, but there are other answers as well, and I'm going to come on to those with my second point, which is about the need for more accountability and responsibility. One of the prime causes of these problems is that when things go wrong, it's often not clear who's responsible, even when they just don't go very right. Of course, when the relationship between civil servants and ministers is working well, the boundaries of who is responsible for what are blurred in a healthy way. A minister might often devise a policy based on advice given to him or her by the civil service team. It's the way it works. But what then happens if that advice is poor? Much of the pandemic planning, for example, was based on flu. We've argued for a clearer responsibility between civil servants and ministers and more direct accountability of the civil service to parliament and to its own leaders. We're proposing a new board for the civil service which would hold its leaders more clearly to account for its performance and would give it more responsibility to maintain the professional skills that a permanent bureaucracy needs. 
And the second part of the answer is strengthening the ability of Parliament to hold government to account. What does that actually mean, though? It means more powers for select committees to summon specific witnesses from the civil service. It means the House of Commons having more control over its own agenda so that the government can't avoid awkward debates by the scheduling. It also means enough transparency so that the media and parliament can get the facts to do their job well. Incompetence in providing consistent government data or the sheer unwillingness to do so is no excuse. And that goes for the devolved nations too. Devolution is deeply popular. The coronavirus has made it more so. The devolved administrations picked their own route through restrictions and by and large, their people really appreciated that. In Wales, where I spend quite a bit of time, you can feel the strengthening of local identity, not really a political force, more a pride in local identity. The UK needs more decentralization within England too. It's not possible to run a complex country well when so much is done from the center. But devolution needs more accountability than the first 20 years have given it. It's as if Blair and Gordon Brown threw all these responsibilities out to the devolved administrations and told them to get out, work it out for themselves. Because devolution is not all roses. Performance of public services in Wales and Scotland in 20 years has been poor, as we showed in a landmark report last year. There are democratic means aplenty in the form of elections for voters to express how they feel about this and their parliaments can challenge their governments on their record. But that does depend on transparency and the quality of data is shockingly poor. The figures of the different nations are astonishingly, even perversely, hard to compare with each other or with the past. One reason we spent so much time compiling this analysis. The need for accountability applies too to arm's length bodies, that awful bit of jargon for public bodies that are independent from central government. NHS England is one. Ofgen and Ofcom, the regulators are others. Modern bureaucracy is vast, and the UK's constitution contains few ways of holding the regulatory state to account, other than in the intensely political theatre of appointing the heads of these bodies. We need much better data, more transparency about the basis for their decisions, and more direct accountability to Parliament again. That brings me to my final point, my third one, the need for an updated constitution these shortcomings are exacerbated by the outdated nature of the UK's constitution. Parliament struggles to hold government to account. It's up to the Prime Minister to call an investigation into whether a minister has broken the ministerial code. And when it is the Prime Minister himself, this procedure has no teeth. The Lords has been described as indispensable for scrutiny, but indefensible in the way that peers are chosen. <laughs> Relationships with Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland are improvised and all this matters for public trust. That's why we've begun a major project working with the Bennett Institute at Cambridge University to review the UK com, uh, Constitution. And our first report on the problems is out now and has benefited from the thoughts of a terrific advisory panel. Part of this constitutional apparatus concerns standards in public life. I said at the beginning that I would conclude by talking about this and about the Prime Minister, and now I will. I don't regard this system as broken, although it could be improved. The UK has lots of rules, and in the past two decades, it's found better ways of enforcing them. If not every figure in public life observes the Nolan principles devised 26 years ago, it doesn't mean that those principles are not generally working. What matters is what happens if they are broken. If there is no sanction, then a culture of not caring about the rules can take hold. Leadership matters. Sometimes it's almost everything, as the Queen illustrates to many people. This investigation into parties held in Downing Street during lockdown has shown how messy the application of the rules is when the Prime Minister is a target of investigation. It was never a good idea to put such weight on one civil servant. Johnson is Sue Gray's ultimate boss, and she is, in effect, was having to decide whether her boss had broken the law. Given that she accepted the task, it was tineered of the Metropolitan Police to undermine it, as they then did. They first deemed the matter not worth investigating because retrospective, then let her do the heavy lifting. Then when she did uncover evidence they thought substantial, swooped in and stopped publication 
of the most significant elements. They should now feel a strong obligation to allow the Gray Report to be published in full when they have concluded their own investigation, as the government has apparently committed itself to doing. And they should also say whether the Prime Minister and his team broke the rules. The polls tell us the verdict of the, the country on Johnson, and it's already damning. While it be Conservative MPs who have the first say on whether he should go, if Johnson himself is fined, or if he is found to have misled Parliament and failed to correct the record, his position probably will be untenable. His authority would be undermined even further, and the standing of the UK and the world damaged further too. In conclusion, we had an extraordinary two years, a test of government that no one foresaw, brought about by the pandemic, and added to that in the past two months, self-inflicted problems of government that no dramatist would have scripted. Much did work well in the pandemic, both at the heart of government and in the public services, thanks to the dedication of public servants. But we're also now soon going to see the beginnings of an inquiry into what went wrong, particularly in the light of the death rate and the initial hit to the economy. During this crisis, the government has repeatedly professed its commitment to reforming the civil service and the machinery of government itself. We're glad to hear it. The dial has moved on what used to be an esoteric conversation. We reckon that the IFG in its 12 years has helped achieve that. There's far more attention on performance, on what government actually manages to achieve than there used to be. There's also an acknowledgement that Britain is not as good at the business of government as it would like to be. That's the kind of change that needs to happen if Britain is going to have a first-class government. The country is now wondering about its future outside the European Union, whether global Britain means anything. It will be relegated to being a second-class country if it has a second-class government. When this government emerges from solving its own problems, if it does, it will need to turn again to solving the countries. It's rightly identified what those are, it won't stand a chance of solving any of them, however, if it doesn't draw on the lessons of the past, nor if it cannot be seen to uphold the basic standards of public life and the rules which it thought essential for the rest of the country. Thank you. Robin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I remind... Uh, those who are participating online, please do start to put your questions in. A number have come through to me already, um, but if you have, as I'm sure you will have, been stimulated by the analysis that Bronwyn has just given us, this is the chance to challenge her, to question her, to uh, perhaps suggest uh, something that may have been overlooked in that analysis. But I'm going to go first to Stephen Bush. Stephen, your, your response. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me, and thank you for that you know, thought-provoking uh, lecture. I wanted to talk a bit about what I thought were some of the interesting strands, and then sort of end with a kind of um, a general thought and perhaps a note of challenge towards the IFG as it enters as it enters its second uh, decade. One of the central achievements I think of the IFG's creation is it means that we have now, as I hope, a permanent adornment to the Westminster scene, a think tank which is devoted to making governments be the best version of themselves they can be. Not necessarily saying, well, you should be more left-wing, more right-wing, more centrist, but look, okay, given what you want to achieve, um, how are you being the best version uh, of yourself? Of course, at the moment, the difficulty is I don't think anyone, um, unless perhaps you are Boris Johnson, could conclude that the government is being the best version of itself. Now, some of that is about individual ministers, decisions made by the Prime Minister and is about people, but some of that of course is about structures and I think you touched well and some of that is of course about an institutional culture that isn't just set by the elected government of the day, uh, but is also about the other half, well the other third, uh, to slightly skip ahead to what I'm going to say then, the other third of the British government um, calculation which is the civil service. I think to me the, 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 the bit of state failure I was most taken aback by uh, this year 
continues to be the, um, the fallout from the Afghanistan withdrawal. I think it's a fantasy to believe that any British Prime Minister, once the United States government had decided to go, could have made the overall withdrawal play out any differently. But I continually think, when I would sit in the select committee hearings, when you, you know, would hear, hear people from the Foreign Diplomatic Service talk about how it played out, continually think back to the preparations for no deal, in which it felt that the, essentially every single civil servant, servant had been drafted into DEFRA to help for, with no deal planning. And we had in the Afghanistan withdrawal a bit of the civil service that both regarded itself as sufficiently separate from the rest of the civil service, and it couldn't even get in a couple of people from DEFRA to process people's claims for uh, asylum and refugee status here in the United Kingdom, but also couldn't even provide expert analysis, deep subject knowledge. Now, of course, that's partly for the reasons you set out very well. Of course, it's also because what has been the economic story since the financial crisis, it's been that to get a raise, you have to get another job. Um, and it's, I think one of the biggest challenges for the government, while it's very welcome that the civil service thinks more about reform, is ultimately if you do not have economic incentives to build subject knowledge and specialism in people's existing roles, you're effectively paying to have churn even within the civil service. I don't know how that can be fixed, not least because in a situation in which not just this government, but governments the world over are facing these two challenges of aging populations and ever expanding demands uh, on healthcare spend, and the challenge of building a zero carbon economic model, to which of course we've added the third challenge of rethinking our economic model because we are, I was about to say we are leaving, we now have left. It's been so long since I've been in an in-person event, I'm like, wow, we must still be in the EU. But <laughs> we certainly were the last time I was in an IFG panel. Um, but now we have left the European Union, we have to rethink that challenge as well. I think you're exactly right to say that the government has actually identified most of the big challenges facing uh, the government, so facing the country as a whole. There is less certainty, as you say, about its ability to meet those challenges. I think the other kind of interesting component is we are, in addition to marking, is it more than 12 years now that the IFG has been in existence, we also are marking almost exactly the point where this Conservative government has been in power for as long without David Cameron as it was with David Cameron. Now, one of the things David Cameron did very well is he didn't reshuffle all that often. Yeah. There were three significant reshuffles in six years, as opposed to the three significant reshuffles it feels like we've had in the last, what, six months um, in, in the life of the present government. I think we've had a pretty good stress test about which one of those approaches is better for getting policies implemented. Of course, as you alluded to, there's a trade-off there in that one of the parts of the government which responded very well and has come out, I think, with a, you know, good pandemic marks has been the efficiency of universal credit in getting money out of the door to households. In fact, it worked so well that the government is now terrified of doing it again uh, in order to help with fuel prices because, you know, God knows how they're going to get that money back if they give it back. So we've had to invent this very complex and slightly silly way of doing it through council tax purely to avoid reminding people just how effective universal credit is at giving households money. Now, and I think universal credit is a really interesting challenge for all of us who care about the machinery of government. Would universal credit have come on stream earlier if Ian Duncan Smith had been moved from that department, as many of us who are interested in delivery thought he should be? Or would universal credit be a worse program without having had this single controlling mind of a Secretary of State who was really invested in the project. We can't know because we can't test the hypothetical, but it's an interesting challenge. I think the one thing we can, yeah, definitely say, as I say, is we can say now, you're better off reshuffling rarely, if at all. My third thought was about devolution. Now, um, if like me, you're interested in devolution, you, I imagine, can guess pretty confidently what the number one Googled subject in the IFG probably is. I'm almost certainly it is, is X devolved? Because in addition to, as you say, this problem, the devolution kind of, this sort of devolve and forget, which has been the problem of Blair and Brown, the problem, I would argue, of Cameron and Osborne, and I think uh, the approach overseen by Michael Gove risks repeating this kind of, oh, we've devolved something, and that's not, yeah, it's not a department mm -hmm. anymore, is that it is impossible, even for an informed person who studies these subjects, to be across 
the complex thicket of things that are devolved in Scotland, aren't devolved in Wales, are devolved but are slightly different in Northern Ireland. You know, right down to the fact that in the most recent white paper, where there's this talk of London-style powers for all of England. I mean, seeing as the only powers the mayor of London has is to uh, is to point at that is for the mayor and the Home Secretary to point at each other and go, the Met's your fault, and to, and to fund TfL. I'm not clear what London-style powers would mean for Worcestershire. I mean, would they be funding the Worcestershire Underground? Getting to sack the PCC occasionally? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a bit, you know, it, it's unclear. This, of course, means that citizens cannot meaningfully hold their devolved institutions to account. If I were to move to Edinburgh, I should, have a, I should, I should essentially be able to understand what things I would talk to my MSP about and what things I would talk to my member of the GLA about, what things I might talk to, you know. I don't quite know why we've, we've decided to get really into in this country giving different names for mayors, depending on whether or not you're a county councillor. But, you know, if, if we were to have a provost in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. I should at least have to have the understanding as a citizen that my provost would have a similar set of powers mm -hmm. to the mayor of London, as opposed to, you know, again, you, you cannot even write about the metro mayors and assume a shared level of powers. Because I do think accountability, which to me it felt was the golden thread of, of your remarks, is the central missing component. Mm -hmm. right? what, you know, why do we have a situation in which most people, including myself, I have to say, uh, think that the government has broken its own coronavirus laws? And I think that attitude, you know, we shouldn't forget how dangerous that is to a government's ability to tackle corruption in the private sector, to collect tax. Once people start to believe that the government is on the take, that is, that is really when you start to circle the drain in terms of state failure and, and effectiveness. It's not really, I think, actually about the invidious position that Sue Gray's been placed in or the difficulties around whether or not Christopher Geith is a properly effective um, investi <laughs> investigator of, of Downing Street. If MPs feel that the investigative options are, that the executive has put forward are inadequate, there are two perfectly good select committees called the Public Accounts Committee, and I'm not going to try and remember exactly what PACAC stands for, because I always get it wrong. It's got constitution in it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I know the word constitution is in there somewhere, and I'm pretty sure that one of the A's stands for affairs. But beyond that, I don't want to make any, any commitment. But as we saw during the Brexit process, MPs can, if they wish to be, be protagonists in this process. Uh, MPs can, yeah, can and should assert themselves as the guarantors of standards in public life. And I think that, so I said I would end with a note of challenge. I think that in some ways, the one, one tiny criticism I would have of the IFG in its first 12 years has been it somehow, sometimes had a bit of a blind spot about the third component of the British government. There's lots of great work that goes on in this building about what Parliament does. But ultimately, Parliament is the thing that you know, shapes both, I mean, everything, as you say, about today's reshuffle is about the Prime Minister's position in, in mm. Parliament. It's this Sudoku puzzle based around going, OK, I need to get Chris Heaton-Harris into the Whip's office. I'm too weak to sack anyone. So how, what lateral moves can I make that allow me to, at the end of the day, have, have created no more enemies than I had? Um, but it's Parliament which will always make up the bulk mm. of recruits to the executive. But it's also Parliament's willingness or lack thereof mm. to engage in its scrutiny function that holds back the ability of governments to properly improve themselves. And I do think the missing component, yeah, you can, you can do some of this stuff with, with electoral reform. I think you can do some of this stuff by having a government that is much more interested in making devolution even and broadly understood by most voters. Uh, so, you know, people should have that sense of, I know what the Senate does. I know what the Scottish Parliament does. This, it's, it's very heartening that the Senate is going to get bigger because it means it will be better at scrutiny. One of the weird things about devolution is it's... Yeah, you can, really, you can really see the sort of the new Labour mind living on in, in these circular chambers which aren't actually really equipped to scrutinise other than if you have a coalition government. But if MPs aren't willing to, to step up, then you don't get those reforms. So I think that would be my, my kind of my missing component, which is to focus on you know, how can MPs be better at the job of being MPs and not just at the job of, uh, of climbing up to eventually get to be Prime Minister. Brilliant. May I respond? Yes, please. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I, I was wondering if you're coming in with a speech of your own. <laughs> Steve, Stephen, thanks very much indeed for, for being with us and, and for that. Um, um, I'm going to say several things, ending up with saying I agree with you about, about Parliament. On three of your tiny points, uh, arguably we are 
13 years old, we had a slow birth. PACAC absolutely has a brand recognition problem. And the most Googled uh, <laughs> page on the IFG, I'm afraid, remains eternally civil service pay and pay, <laughs> and pay bands. Yeah. Let, me, let me take through your, 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 um, your real points. What the Afghan exit tells us, the universal credit, and, and then your point about parliament. Um, the Afghan exit, I think, I think is more of a horror than the shudder of national shame that went up at the scramble out of, uh, out of Kabul actually conveyed. And the reason is more of a horror is because we should have known. We had, Britain, plenty of reason to think that uh, the US, uh, once Joe Biden took over and did not substantially change Donald Trump's negotiations with, with the Taliban made clear he was going to, the, the, the implication of that um, was, was widely discussed and widely foretold that the Taliban would eventually take the country. Um, uh, when, uh, a question, but uh, we had arguably six months um, in which we could have prepared. And what does that, what does that tell us uh, about British government? It might tell us something about the lack of Afghan expertise, but I think it also tells us something about the way some problems, not all, but some problems in government do not feel real um, to the people engaged in trying to solve them. It may be because they don't have the immersion in that subject that would be giving them the phone calls, the chatter, uh, the predictions from Pakistani journalists and, 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 and all that. They're, they're not immersed in it. It may be because the constituency of people who were really going to be hurt by it was there, not here. But the fact it was one of those that didn't feel real, and I'd extend this to quite a bit of the, the military as well, as the months went by, and then we um, were in, in this scramble right at the end. Now, it didn't feel particularly real, I think, to the US um, either, but they were obviously in control of it, and once the military chiefs had said to Biden, back in the spring, look, uh, we don't think it's a good idea, and he said, I'm going to do it anyway. All right, they, 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 they could see more what was coming, even if the speed took them by surprise. But it's that air of unreality that bothers me um, about aspects of British government. Raise universal credit, which I think is, is uh, extremely interesting, and you, 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 you repeated almost word for word a conversation we were having in our Friday comments meeting last, last week, um, about, both about the value of continuity um, and, uh, and, and, and why the government was not using what is a much maligned but now successful mechanism for distributing money to the people who need it most um, is a puzzle. Um, uh, and you shared your scepticism about the, the council tax um, mechanism. But the role of, of, of in Duncan Smith, I, th I think it's is, is terribly interesting. I would, I would slightly dodge the question by saying that what it really benefited from is having cross-party support at the beginning. All parties thought it was a good idea. It sounded great to get benefits neatly to people to, to, to simplify the system. Um, the problems came from rushing, from lack of trialing, all kinds of things, and, and from the kind of brutality of some of the early decrees that people must wait for their uh, their, their money, um, but it did benefit from the at least initial cross-party support, and I think that is one of the features of things that have been more successful because they get longer time to work, and that the other side doesn't jump on them. And you could say the same about uh, aspects of schools uh, and, and, and some aspects of, of health. Your point about Parliament, I, I entirely agree, and I could say, uh, waving around a flag, that this is why we're now doing uh, substantial work on the, the Constitution. We've always done work on Parliament, and my uh, colleagues are expert in the failings and strengths of select committees and how they can, they, can, they can do it better. MPs vary a lot in how interested they are in that, um, in seeing an alternative route um, political career uh, through the committees but it's become more popular as more significant figures have found themselves defenestrated. Yeah. Bronwyn, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move to, to questions now. And I'd say also to, to plenty I've come in already online on Slido, and if people in the room want to ask questions, including 
IFG staff, um, then please don't feel shy about do it, doing that. And could I ask people in the room if, to when, if they're called, just to uh, say you know, who they are and, uh, and where, where they're from? That would be, be helpful as well. Um, can I go straight to the question that, that Stephen also raised in talking about the lack of economic incentives for people to build up expertise? Mm. Um, the question, somebody who prefers not to give his name, saying, say, you know, why does the civil service not make it possible for an individual to receive promotion in their area of expertise? It's a really good question, which we spend a lot of time analysing. It has got slightly better, but this, this um, machinery... Um, of, um, of, of, of promotion and pay is enormously hard to grapple with. Our individual initiatives, we've put out many reports on how to strengthen those, um, and my colleagues will be eloquent on the, the ways of, of, of tweaking it, but it is very hard. You run again and again uh, into um, departments saying, I need this niche person, um, or we need this area of speciality, and I can hire someone, I can pay more if I'm hiring someone in, but I can't promote the people who are, um, and, I, and pay them much more unless they're changing grade or something. And it, 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 um, it, it is a trap that a large bureaucracy has constructed over the years and is finding ways at the margin to, to get better at, but it is, it is really very hard. Thank you. There's another question, also anonymous. It says, excellent analysis, but aren't many of these problems shared by other countries? So, for example, as close geographically as the rest of Europe, and is the UK demonstrably worse? And I suppose I'd add, you know, is there a role model around the world that you might point to as one we should emulate? That's both really interesting questions. Um, we do a certain amount of international comparison. It's very striking how much um, countries um, instantly are so different in the ways that they organize themselves that the generalization um, risks being banal if you're really going to try and take lessons from it. Some, some precise lessons I think we do find very valuable. It can be on really niche things like digital government, um, on, the speciality, uh, on the specialization, and so on. On some constitutional things, absolutely, like... Um, federalization on how, on how countries get devolution to work. But you're instantly into cultural questions, which um, countries themselves um, battle with, and that can seem no, uh, have, to no, have no parallel here. I'm thinking of what uh, President Macron is doing in France, of trying to overturn the ENARC culture, um, renaming the civil service school, uh, trying to shatter the, the promotion um, avenues that have um, been there. And we could, might take inspiration from the direction of travel, but a lot of that is steeped in uh, the very uh, specifics of the French tradition of that. Um, in terms of where we, we, we look for um, uh, comparisons, I, and, and there always comes a point in these conversations where someone says Singapore. Um, or if it's digital government, they say Estonia. Um, and then someone will say New Zealand. And I'm wary of this kind of um, snap game of, of, um, of, of comparisons. New Zealand, uh, many things work well. But it's given as a country a great deal of thought to government and how it works. But it is much, much smaller. Singapore is not a democracy. And I think this matters for some of the things we're talking about, crucially, for the holding to account, for the, um, the way Parliament, um, Parliament in particular, and the, and, and the public separately, um, can hold uh, politicians and civil servants to account. And so uh, even if you find something, you, you see a perfectly running machine somewhere else, and you think, well, have some of that. It's actually very hard to bottle. First bit of the question was, I mean, do all countries have these problems? They have some of the big macro problems, but they answer them in very different different ways. And um, no, I think they don't have them in quite this, some of what I've been talking about, some of the unreality, some of the struggles mm. to deliver solutions, I don't think 
uh, I come across in quite the same way, even in Western Europe. Stephen, sorry. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things, I think one, Bron was exactly right, then, particularly one of the reasons why Singapore is not helpful as a comparison is that as frustrating as today's reshuffle is for people who care about good government, it is wholly legitimate for the elected government to want to remain the elected government. Um, you know, it, it was wholly legitimate in 2017 for Theresa May to do this slightly strange reshuffle based solely around how can I get Michael Gove from being the biggest threat on the backbenches to be within the heart of government again. It's wholly legitimate for Boris Johnson to do this even more strange reshuffle um, today. And all of us who are interested in government working well have got to recognise that political constraint. The strange thing is, one of the things which makes it difficult to make cross-country comparisons is a thing we genuinely are world leading on, which is the ONS, which is this fantastic, incredibly transparent, brilliant resource that people should stop being mean about. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But it does mean that when you want to write a cross-country comparison, you often struggle with the fact that you're dealing with a much worse and less transparent quality of data uh, that we do really take, take for granted. It, in some ways, I think, yeah, ultimately, the, 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 job, the essay question is always, how can this government be the best version of itself? And that means being, as you say, the weird cultural legacies of any specific country, which also make comparisons so hard. Thank you. Question in the room. John McTenney, a senior fellow here at the Institute of Government uh, and a recovering political advisor. <laughs> um, so I wondered, Brian, if you would speculate a bit on some of the big questions you think we're not discussing. Um, is it net zero, you know, government's not focusing, you know, or is it AI, is it the metaverse? Um, and, and then also, how could, how, what are the challenges to a government to build trust with a country, to have those discussions about big issues when it's failing on the manifest, like housing uh, or uh, cost of living. So that the proximate questions are being failed on. How do you get a legitimate conversation? And on New Zealand, uh, they built 26 Kiwi built houses in the first term of Jacinda Ardern. She was saved by the pandemic. Uh, they, from, they built what? They, 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 their big housing program was meant to be a thousand houses a year. They built twenty six. Um, <laughs> it was so on the core delivery thing. They were saved by the pandemic. Um, so no, don't go to look mm. to New Zealand or Singapore. Uh, John, thank you. Um, I think governments can't solve more than a few big problems, although they have to say that they are working on them all. And the big problems are, you know, are, are, are obvious. Um, uh, I, you know, one of the biggest is the, the level of public services that this country wants, um, not matched by a desire to pay at this point that much, uh, that much tax and a, uh, um, you know, a, a, an economic recovery that is bumpy and um, very likely not, not, not where, where the government thought it would be. Um, I think it, it can only pick, you know, one or two. And even in levelling up and net zero, it may have two that are pulling in different directions. Um, and then it, all that may be subsumed in the cost of living um, crisis. I agree with you that things, that the big problems that take years, and housing is a very, very good one, um, get brushed aside. We've seen a couple of attempts by this government to suggest things that would... Um, give more powers uh, to housing, and we've seen some targets, and then that, that has been essentially brushed aside. Um, I, they have to focus and ho have to hope that they are there for um, more than one term. I mean, very, very hard to get anything done in one term in government these days. I'm going to go um, back online. Claire Dory asks, local government is arguably one of the pandemic success stories but remains mistrusted and misunderstood by central government. How might that relationship be changed to realise local government's potential to be instrumental in solving some of the compelling problems? A really good question. I'd be interested in Stephen's answer as, as well on this. Um, I, I, I've got one answer, which is um, to remove the responsibility of paying for social care from it even if local government is responsible for it. I think it's a huge democratic problem building up that people like local government and they think they're paying uh, in their local taxes for all kinds of things that they appreciate, like 
libraries and parks and the things that they got to see more of in coronavirus. And yet these budgets, because of the quirks of and the decisions made in, 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 in the centre, both about cutting local government budgets and while allowing them to keep the burden of social care and that burden growing, it just means that the social care is squeezing out everything else that local government does. If they try and get round the edge and go borrowing money uh, in a, uh, on high street property, we've begun to see where uh, that um, now curtailed activity gets them to. Um, they really have a very difficult job. So I, th I think separating out what they actually are responsible for is one. And um, I'm not going to wave a wand and say uh, mayors everywhere would do it, but I think there is an appetite for mayors in a way that there, 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 there wasn't, in a sense that they do do some good. Though we have a study running at the moment trying to pin down exactly what good they do and what economic help they may have brought to their region, which is... Um, as always, very elusive, but it's not finished yet. I think one one of the sort of inescapable sources of tension at the moment is that we have this weird situation where we have had a government that's been in power for almost 12 years now, but it is still the largest party in local government, which hasn't really yeah. happened before. So usually the reason why a government has been in office this long distrusts mm -hmm. local government is that governments don't like, on the whole, handing power uh, to um, yeah to to government mm. to people other than their own party, which actually has been a, a welcome uh, thing that has not been true of this government as well. But the but the successive Conservative administrations since 2010 have been politically rewarded for you know both devolving responsibility for difficult issues like social care, devolving quite a large chunk of the spending retrenchment over the last decade to a local government and going nothing to do with me which obviously creates a relationship of distrust. You know, even, you know, sometimes it feels, you know, you speak to people at, at the top of this government um, and from the way they talk, you'd think that, you know, Andy Street was some kind of Maoist or Ben Houchen was some kind of communist. And, you know, that's even before they get onto the Labour mayors. But I think one of the real advantages mayors have is because um, they can be figureheads and ambassadors for their areas, they are better placed to advocate for both... Yeah, one of the, the slight problem with devolution is you get this rash of people continually asking for more powers while not using the powers that they have. But it does at least mean you have a countervailing force going, well, actually, look, I'm not responsible for this. The government is. Because the real problem for local government, I think this question, one of the reasons why it's such a good question, is that local government has proven it's the bit of the state which can reliably do final mile stuff, which is something that, in general, the British state can't do. But it's also proved that it's great at carrying the can for political risk. So I think part of what rebalances the relationship is local government becoming more vocal. But I think the interesting, yeah, the, yeah I'm really looking forward to what you, you make of them. But the interesting sort of flip side is the other thing mayors have been worse about is entrenching issues with local government corruption because they are both figureheads for the media and for the legitimate economy, but they can also be figureheads for the underground economy. And so, yeah, they do need to be considered in the, in the round. And I think it's a real risk with local government. I mean, yeah. it, that is part of what the last mile... It involves and you've got people and developers with tons of money mm. up against either local councils or uh, you can be eclipsed in their sophistication deal dealing with these people it's it's a real risk and the councils don't have very much money go to another question in the room Well, thank you, Bronwyn, for that fascinating speech, and Stephen for that really insightful analysis. Uh, this is slightly unorthodox, but I actually have a question. It's about churn, again, um, because that's something the readers of Civil Service World are very interested in. Um, but it's for a couple of people in the audience. I noticed a couple of former perm sex here today, two dames. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to pick your brains, Dame, Dame Una and Dame Claire, from the... Because you've probably been... On both sides of this, you've probably had jobs that you were, you know, earlier on in your career that you were really getting your teeth into and you're loving. And then, you know, an opportunity, someone, your director general, whoever suggested, oh, why didn't you move on after 18 months? It'd be a good way to get a pay rise. And equally, you've uh, probably had staff when you reached a more senior level who you've been really gutted to lose because they've moved on. And so I just wondered if you had any thoughts, either of you, um, in, an, in an era of austerity and kind of nominal pay rises, um, what, uh, do you have any thoughts on churn and how to prevent it? 
No. I'm not sure our cameras are going to be up to this. No. But they, they, <laughs> they, apologies to the online. So, so it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, in my experience was mostly of being hoiked out of things that I was stuck into and sent to do something else um, because that was the, what, was what the, the, the department needed. So I used to describe myself as the Department of Health's human cannonball um, because I was endlessly uh, doing jobs and then... It, but it was very much... A, it was a business need. I don't remember myself getting, you know, thinking, I've only done this job for a short amount of time, but I want to go for the next level, and so I'm going to uh, put myself forward. It was much more that there is a constant... Ch there is a kind of... Well, there was, back in the day, a constant supply of problems that need fixing, and I think there was probably a, an under-availability of people who could be hurled into things to go and do them. Um, so, so it was more about, this is what you need... You know, there's a, there, we, we just need to fix the same problem. And one, one of the stories I tell is about turning up. I, I went to a new job, turned up in the in the you know in the kitchen to make a cup of tea, and I met an, a former colleague, and his face just dropped as he saw me. And he said, "If it, you're here, it must be really bad." <laughs> <laughs> but I think I mean I think it's certainly having and, and Una will remember the same thing. You know, sat in a lot of conversations about churn related to pay. I mean, that's true, but you have to... You know, it all comes back to politics. The, you know, mm. the way in which pay in the civil service is constrained is fundamentally to do with the optics of it and what people feel about how much it's reasonable to pay civil servants to give them in terms of pay rises. So you know, and the, the point I wanted to make more broadly is that you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of kind of criticism of the civil service, um, but the way the civil service operates is fundamentally to do with being in an adversarial majoritarian yeah. political system, um, and that drives yeah. back into what people do. I was also going to say, I don't, I don't recognise a description of people not caring and being indifferent, but that's possibly another comment. I'll just add two, two points to that. Una O'Brien, former permanent at the Department of Health. Um, when I joined the civil service in 1990... It was broadly populated by people who had stayed in a single job or a single area for a very, very long time. And in, in simple terms, the analysis was that that led to almost a sort of external capture. Um, people became so close to the external grouping that they related to that often they weren't bringing independent analysis or necessarily bridging the link to what the government of the day wanted as effectively as the governments were expecting. So the, there was a reason why things changed. Arguably, it has gone too far, but there was one um, it, it, it thought I had, Bronwyn, when you were talking about the excessive amount of churn. There is a need for, um, particularly in very complex areas like energy, like health, um, like environment, for certain cadre of civil servants to get ex, uh, experience across a range of different roles. Because without that, they're really not much use mm. to ministers. So, uh, for example, uh, to have senior civil servants in the Department of Health who've worked in the NHS, we currently have some DGs there, for example, who've got a fantastic array of experience. Mm. They've been out in the NHS, they've worked in local government, they come back into the Department of Health. So if they'd stayed in a single job down the years, I'm not sure that they would be as useful. So I think there is a, a subtlety to the churn argument that mm. it's important to embrace, although I do agree with you that there is a fundamental issue about the pay and conditions, which is, uh, needs to be addressed. Mm. Well, thank, you both, thank you both very much for, for, for that. You put, you put it beautifully. Um, we had a, a interesting speech by John Kingman last year, formerly of the Treasury now, uh, and then of UKRI, making a case for uh, paying um, some civil servants a lot more and in order to give the civil service the skills that it needs and to be able to hold on to those people. And I think that is absolutely justified. And it is very hard to address the structures without coming to that kind of conclusion and if the civil service is going to hold on to the many brilliant people who could go elsewhere um, and do all kinds of things with their talents and if it's to recruit some of the people and the scientists that he was putting up on an eternal wish for recruiting um, you know that that needs to be addressed and you uh, absolutely rightly touched at the beginning on the political 
conditions that make that, along with MPs pay, um, uh, uh, absolutely impossible. Um, it, it, you put many of the points um, no, ex it, extremely well. Um, the not caring, I, I have, um, colleagues have found most in people who are simply moving very fast and so not immersed in their subject. Um, I have got lots of questions both in the room and online, so let me get to as many as I can. Um, Tom McNally asks, has the growth in numbers and power of special advisors fatally undermined the concept of a civil service politically neutral and selected on merit? I, it, um, I love Stephen's view on this one as well. Um, many civil servants don't like them, um, and it is a question of number. I was right that there is a cap on the number. I, I have some sympathy for politicians on this. It, it seems to me, I mean, however brilliant and dedicated the team of the civil service, there is something about having, if you're trying to bring about change, having a small number of people around you who can reflect back to you at the end of the day or end of the week what it is that you're trying to do, speaking the same language. It is incredibly valuable. And given the stresses that ministers are under um, these days, I think one shouldn't write off that kind of um, support. Obviously, you can get good special advisors, you can get very bad ones or who aren't very special. Um, and and are, aren't up to scratch in terms of offering advice and where that advice is inferior to the advice that the civil services is giving. But I think they do add something. It really is about both the number of them and about their role in the office. If they're pu pulling around the wagons and shutting out the civil service, then you've got a destructive relationship. And you know, when, when it works best, the ministers and civil servants are working very close, uh, closely together it's, it's when the heat rises and when there's a sense of um, antagonism or things not, not going right. Um, that's when you get those tensions. Uh, there does need to be a cap on them or there'd be uh, loads and loads more. But I do think they play a really important role and they can be some answer to what we've just been discussing here, which is the lack of a, a particular kind of specialist and very current knowledge. Yeah, I, mean, I think... Yeah, I, I'm a great uh, defender of special advisors, not just the ones who answer my calls. Um, you know, the one, we've had them for quite a long time, right? So, you know, the, the, uh, the first special advisors are now 90-year-olds. So I think it's very difficult to blame a Harold Wilson-era innovation for the problems of the modern British state. Uh, and it is useful, I think. Actually, I, think it, I actually think it enhances the neutrality of the neutral bit. Yeah, I think... I think it is, was much more harmful than you had Bernard, Bernard Ingham, a person whose political status was slightly unclear, than that you have Gitto Harry, someone whose political status is very clear in that comms job in Downing Street. So I think special advisors are a useful part of the mix. However, however look, your hiring process is always better the more transparent it is and the more open you are about the hiring process. And um, whatever one, one thinks of his commitment to openness and transparency in other fields, um, it remains pretty dispiriting than the only person to have run any kind of open recruitment on a large scale for Downing Street special advisors is Dominic Cummings on his blog. Uh, I think actually the, the, big, the biggest thing that we could do to improve the quality of government is to improve the way that we hire special advisors so you don't have and again many of them uh including the ones who call me back uh are, are great and you know would have progressed through a more transparent hiring process but you do have particularly at the start of governments lots of people who perhaps aren't at the quality level than um than you would wish and that does have an impact on the, their ability to do their jobs. That creates friction rather than useful creative tension in departments. But no, I think civil, sorry, I think special advisors are an important part of, of getting government. It's good to have, you know, it's the same actually with group advisors in local government, right? It is important to have someone who can think politically because that avoids the civil service being pulled into having to do that kind of like, but minister, what about the ex-state ex by-election? But yeah, they're, they're great, they're, they're, they're important. I want to put a question to, about regulators, because we haven't touched mm. on that yet. Uh, it's an anonymous one. That, uh, the question says, we live in a regulatory state. 
but it's easy for them to hide behind the complexities of the industries they regulate, the power, water, environment, and so on. What sort of reforms, changes would you like to see? This is a really interesting point. Um, we're just beginning to look um, in depth at this, so I can't, I can't draw on and, and, and cite you loads and loads of ISG work over the ages, but I spent um, quite a bit of time actually at the FT writing about them back when many of them were being created. Um, and their initially very clear role, I'm thinking of the regulators of the privatized industries in particular, so energy and telecoms and stuff, it was initially going to be very, very um, clear. They were going to have a formula that would set the prices, um, uh, that would take the politics out of it, uh, the politicians wouldn't have to fret over your phone line or your energy bills being too, too, too high. And then it, it uh, and, and they would then, you know, give the company some incentives for investment. And then it just got almost immediately more complicated. Um, some of these things were more subjective, the question of the standards that water companies had to meet and so on. And you found within years that the whole regulatory regime was departing from this marvellous um, vision of purity conjured up by Stephen Little, Littlechild and others. And what you've got now is a bit of a mess, um, and, and, and an intensely political mess at that. And we can see this with en energy uh, prices and energy cap that came in, and the regulator trying to deal with this, and um, then, pr then produced what we've got now. Um, I, again, I, and it, I, I dislike and I don't think it's helpful, the politics that we see in this of um, tense battling for will Paul Dacre be head of Ofcom, uh, who are we going to put in um, you know, on, on this. I, I go back to one of your first points, Stephen, and say in this, uh, roads should lead to Parliament much, um, much more quickly. And instead, politicians are treating these as independent watchdogs, regulators, but not very independent. And I, I think more independence, much more transparency about how they are making their decisions. Um, some of these are, in the end, going to be political decisions. Um, you know, how, how much of, is, is energy going to be subsidised, and and so on. But the sort of miasm of politics um, uh, that hangs over it, and the the lack of visibility of a lot of these decisions, I think, is a real. Problem. And then you get you know, a good regulator that, that might have been working for years, like Ofcom, which started as an economic regulator. Uh, should mobile companies merge? And then it got bits of, you know, of content of should uh, RT and um, Iran's press TV, should those be thrown out for what they're doing? And suddenly it gets the BBC, it gets uh, digital uh, content, it gets, it, it suddenly becomes that this, everything that is to do with communications suddenly gets loaded on this regulator um, in a way supposedly to depoliticize it, but it doesn't at all. Uh, it, it just brings the government into the heart of the regulator. And I think the government should stop messing with them. They need a bit of a, a clean out and then much, much clearer accountability. Stephen? Yeah, I think. It's interesting. Inevitably, the, the question always is, to what extent are we talking about a British government disease and to what extent are we talking about a British disease? I think in some cases, some of the issues around incentives in the civil service uh, and you know, the lack of reward for ex expertise, that is a pretty familiar story to most people who are studying or engaged in the British labour market. And in some ways, the problem particularly of Ofcom, which in many ways still is a great regulator, but has had this problem that it feels like whenever something is difficult, then ministers can go, oh, we can give this to a regulator which still works well. Yeah, that's, maybe that's an Ofcom. And it just becomes oh, more and more overladen, which I would say is actually a pretty familiar problem in mm. the British society and economy in general. You know, things which are successful are made to take on more and more weight until they are, are no longer successful. I do think oh, Bronwyn's exactly right. This comes right back to Parliament. Select, one of the things that select committee chairs should both be empowered and expected to do is to um, chairmark, as it were, their regulator. Um, they, you know, then I, I think it's good that we pay select committee chairs more. I think we should pay select committee members more and give them bigger staff budgets. But I think we also ought to say, well, look, 
in addition to doing your sort of, and now I'm gonna ask a pointed question for my Facebook feed, you are also going to go, okay, so if off what is in your sphere of your select committee, you should, over the course of the parliament, do at least one major select committee report on whether or not off what is doing well. Uh, Ofcom is also a great model because it is actually quite transparent in terms of explaining things like, here's why we do this thing in the watershed, here's how we've reached this conclusion. And transparency by default is a major digital dividend that bits of the British state are seizing brilliantly and bits of the British state aren't. May, may I just, just yeah. add to this? I mean, this, is a, this isn't just a British problem. This is a problem of modern governments. Um, they need vast amounts of this regulatory apparatus. And, and now they've got, and you put unelected people in charge of them. And, and the, the whole democratic structure, I think, cannot stand too much um, of huge decisions affecting people's lives being taken by unelected people without some answer to, you know, w what's people's recourse? Yeah. And, so we're uh, we're going to have to stop at, soon. At the back. Uh, hello. Um, my Hello, my name's Henry Dyer. I'm a politics reporter at Insider. Um, I wanted to ask what can be done to um, encourage and support civil servants who have concerns about standards. I think one of the most interesting things about both Partygate and uh, the Owen Patterson affair were that a lot of civil servants were involved in, um, in parties across government, and there were civil servants involved in organizing meetings uh, which involved Owen Patterson with the knowledge that he was a paid lobbyist, but yet nothing was done about it at the time, perhaps because it was seen as a political matter to get involved, or is it simply that it's a matter of civil servants feeling loyalty towards each other and, and towards their ministers, but standards suffering as a result of it? Just forgive me, and, and I, I'm really sorry at the beginning of your question. I was, I was consulting with David about the time, but in it, your point is that um, officials are, have, have... They've been involved. They've been in involved, the, the involved in the, in the, comp and, and the compromise. And blow the whistle on the, the Patterson lobby. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, at this point, feel I know enough details to give you a ringing answer to that. I mean, one of the things I think we, 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 that everyone wants is an account of responsibility here. But they were, um, they obviously have an ability to say, to say no, but they were obviously directed in a lot of what they were doing by their, their ministers. Well, apologies um, to everybody because we have hit our time limit. I'm gonna have to call a halt to proceedings now. Um, the fact that there is still a very large number of people both in the room and on Slido who are wanting to ask questions, yeah, Robin, I think yeah. is a, a mark of how much uh, your lecture and Stephen's response to it have stimulated thought. And I'm sure that the debate amongst those who've, who've uh, been listening uh, will continue outside this meeting. I hope that you will regard it as a mark of success if I say that one of the questions on Slido was, can we make listening to the director's uh, lecture compulsory for members of the civil service? Uh, so, on that no, note, no, no, I, no, uh, no, 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 no. This is absolutely against against against, against the spirit of the um, uh, IFT. So, not, um, not, not necessarily um, thank you for the compliment designed to, yeah, to, yeah. to actually ha have the right effect as well once it becomes compulsory. But can I say to everybody, thank you for joining us this evening, and can we please finish with a Round of applause for Robin and for Stephen. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that.